Okay. Um, so thanks everybody for making it out, especially with the, the, uh, the time change. Um, and thanks Andrew for, for um, coming to speak. Um, so this week we've got Andrew Schwartz um, from the Southeast Missouri State University who will be talking about zero forcing sets and H matchable graphs. Go ahead and take us away. All right, well, thank you. Uh, yeah, Mike, that, uh... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Liza, I thought I heard somebody. Liza, okay. did you have something to say? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I think it was maybe an accident. Go ahead, Andrew, sorry. Oh, no worries. All right, well, uh, thank you, uh, Drew, for an, uh, inviting me to uh, speak today at your uh, seminar. Um, as he indicated in one of his emails, you know, gives uh, seminars around the country, you know, unique opportunities given our current situation with uh, Zooming and whatnot to, uh, you know, see some uh, speakers that are well outside our normal, uh, um, <clears throat> our, our uh, normal driving distance, for instance, I guess. Uh, and again, thank you very much for having me today. I greatly appreciate it. Um, so today I'd like to talk about uh, zero forcing sets in uh, H matchable graphs. Okay. There we go. All right. Now, uh, just kind of uh, go back over the uh, abstract that we had here for the talk. So in this talk, uh, we'll consider a graph G to be, you know, an ordered pair of a vertex set and an edge set. It has no uh, isolated vertices. Uh, it's going to be finite, simple, and uh, undirected. And if we fix a non-trivial connected graph H, we consider a perfect H matching of a graph G is a set H sub one through H sub N of vertex induced subgraphs of G. In other words, uh, if we isolate uh, G down to its individual uh, vertex sets H sub I, then it's gonna be equal to the, uh, the uh, <coughs> H sub I, so each uh, in, uh, vertex induced copy, right? Um, so, uh, and it also is going to partition all the vertices here of G, right? And uh, each subgraph H sub I is going to be isomorphic to this graph H that we have in mind. Um, so two perfect H matchings are of G we would consider equal if they are equal as sets of graphs. And a perfect matching of G is then a perfect P sub two matching of G. All right, so we're kind of seeing that this is basically kind of one way of generalizing the whole a concept of uh, perfect matchings of graphs, right? Just instead of like, little copies of P sub two, now we'll just kind of consider a, a general graph H uh, that uh, we have uh, in, inside of uh, in multiple uh, copies of this H inside of G here, okay? And we say that G is H matchable or matchable, right? So borrowing that terminology again, uh, if and only if G has a perfect H matching, in other words, uh, so again, borrowing the terminology from perfect matchings, all right? Uh, and if G has a perfect H matching, then uh, the order of the, uh, the number of vertices of G, right, has to be congruent to zero mod uh, the number of vertices of H, all right? And we'll assume that throughout the talk. All right, so let's kind of just start out with a <clears throat> quick uh, visual example. So this, for instance, would be an example of a uh, claw matchable graph, right? And I'll highlight it just to show in green all these little different copies of uh, the claw, right? So this is kind of that, uh, <clears throat> a visualization of this idea. And this is not a claw matchable graph, all right? So we can see that we do have uh, one issue here. Uh, did anybody wanna point out exactly where it's, where it's at? Go ahead. The upper left corner of the sample matching. Ah, yes, absolutely right. That's correct. Uh, yeah, the upper left corner, right? And so I've highlighted that one on this slide in orange to show, you know, that it sticks out, right? One of these is uh, not like the other, right? So it uh, fails to be a, a perfect claw matchable graph, right? Just go to this little one up here on the left. I have a piece of four there instead. Uh, all right. So now we have, uh, we want to give an algorithm uh, for, for looking at these. So uh, uh, it generates all uh, H matchable graphs with vertex sets uh, uh, Rn. And in this uh, algorithm, uh, this sum here from goes from K 
to equals two to M of U sub K V sub K. Now it's empty for whenever M is less than or equal to one. And here the order of uh, H, all right, the number of vertices of H is just gonna be equal to R. Uh, so our algorithm, uh, H matchable tree is gonna start with the input of a tree T, all right, uh, to start as the empty set. And the output is to become an H matchable tree with vertex set RN. All right, um, and then here's our uh, algorithm. Um, so I don't wanna read off all of this uh, pseudo code here, but uh, we can see that we uh, are basically going through and we're updating uh, as, as we move along. All right, so uh, just choosing a copy H sub M uh, sub, or H sub M plus one, excuse me, of H uh, with uh, its vertex set as a subset of that uh, set uh, of numbers one through Rn, right, bracket to Rn, in other words. Um, and it's a, of course, naturally it's an iterative, uh, iterative process, right? And so while M is less than N, we're just gonna keep repeating this step two here, all right? Uh, where we're just kind of basically uh, appending these edges, right, in that step two A, B, B, all right? Uh, and then when M finally hits M, we stop, and then we output uh, this, gra this graph. All right, so I kind of want to just uh, go through just one quick example of how this algorithm is utilized. All right. So, but before we do that, uh, I just was going to uh, state that uh, our quick observation is that this does indeed uh, output a tree. Uh, T is equal to H sub zero, H sub one through H sub n plus uh, sigma uh, k uh, equals two to n of u sub k v sub k with per perfect h matching h sub one through h sub n specifically. So we're we're look, they have a specific h matching that we actually have in mind uh, that this is generating. Right, a very specific example. Uh, and uh, here's our uh, uh, ideas behind it. Right. So suppose s is a tree of order n and v is a vertex of that uh, of s. Uh, and let T sub S of V denote the number of distinct sequences of trees, S sub one, S sub two through S sub N, where uh, we have this nested sequence, right? When we finally, till we finally obtain uh, S sub N, which is equal to S. And each S uh, tree S sub K has order K. And for a specific matching H one through H N uh, in the total number of a matchings uh, N of P sub two, uh, we find that phi sub m uh, goes from a of m p sub 2 to t m, where uh, phi sub m t is the graph with vertex set m obtained from all trees in that uh, set of a m p sub 2 by contracting each tree, right, h sub i to the vertex h sub i. So we're basically taking each one of those copies of h, and we want to think about just shrinking it down to an individual vertex. All right. Um, also, another observation is, and let's see, I'm kind of, let me see if I can move this off of my slide here a little bit. There we go. All right. Each tree T uh, in A, uh, NH is generated uh, by this uh, uh, sum V goes uh, in uh, all the matchings M of T sub S of V times in an algorithm H matchable tree, where T is in uh, A of M H. And now this is for, a, again, a unique M in the set of all matchings M, uh, script M uh, of uh, N H. And S is the phi sub M of T. So we wanna think about uh, phi sub M as this uh, contraction map, all right? Okie doke, all right, I get that out of the way. All right, now I'll go to, uh, <clears throat> sorry, I gotta kinda move this little, screen sharing thing around so it's not covering up pieces of my slide. <laughs> um, now, here's, our, here's the example that I promised you. Uh, if we take M uh, to be the matching uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, right? And the set of all matchings on, uh, on three vertices uh, for piece of two and tree T is all in the set of all uh, trees with this perfect uh, piece of two matching, right? With vertex set uh, bracket six and the edge set one, two, one, three, three, four, three, five, five, six. Then the tree S is equal to a phi sub M of T has three vertices, one, two, three, four, five, six. 
and where one, two is adjacent to three, four is adjacent to five, six. All right, so then the way this kind of uh, looks is we have T sub, A, T sub S of one, two is uh, one, right? We have one, two, where one, two is adjacent to three, four, and then one, two is adjacent to three, four is adjacent to five, six. And then T sub S of three, four is equal to two, where we have uh, <coughs> these, uh, uh, two items here, uh, 30, 34, where 34 is adjacent to 12, 56 is adjacent to 34 is adjacent to 12, and then 34 where 34 is adjacent to 56, and 12, 1, 2 is adjacent to 34 is adjacent to 56. And then T sub S of 56 is equal to 1, uh, where we have the, or, uh, <clears throat> the order triple 56, 56 is adjacent to 34, and 56 is adjacent to 34 is adjacent to all right, so hence our, our sum that we were looking at of T sub S of V is equal to four. All right, an algorithm H matchable tree generates precisely four distinct tuples uh, giving our tree T that we're, that's of interest here. All right, so we have phi uh, of a one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, and then add in one, three, add in three, five. And we also have phi of three, four, one, two, five, six, and then add in uh, one, three, and three, five. And then we have phi of three, four, five, six, one, two, and then add in uh, three, five, and one, three. And then we also have phi of five, six, three, four, one, two, and we add in three, five, one, three. All right. Um, oops, let me see here. Oh, there we go. All right, so this is the T, this is the tree T that we generated here in the, in the, in the example given, right? So there's uh, the one, two that gets contracted to a single edge underneath the contraction map, three, four, of course, or sorry, to a single vertex, excuse me. One, two gets uh, contracted to a single vertex, uh, three, four, of course, as well, and five, six, right? So that's just a real simple uh, example of the implementation of our algorithm. All right. Now, this algorithm um, is, I, I kind of summarized some, some results here in table one of, of, of previous results, right, to kind of show that I, uh, <clears throat> as far as finding a uh, perfect H matching in general, when uh, the graph H has a component of order greater than or equal to uh, three, uh, <clears throat> that was actually known uh, with the instance being a graph, Gee, that was actually known to be uh, NP complete and uh, a publication by Hell. Um, and uh, if the instance instead is a graph G with a perfect uh, K3 matching or a tripart, uh, <clears throat> a perfect triangle matching, that's known to be uh, NP complete uh, in uh, a publication that I've uh, labeled a GT11 that's uh, listed later on in the references. Uh, and if instead G is a bipartite graph and whether it has a uh, perfect matching or not, that's actually complexity is known to be a course polynomial due to Edmonds. Um, now, if the instance switches instead to a tree G uh, and we have a subgraph isomorphic to a forest, uh, forest H, that's known to be NP complete and that was proven by Matula in uh, the um, G and GT48. And uh, forest uh, G, all right, that subgraph or symorphic to a tree H, that's known to actually be polynomial by Matula in that uh, same uh, uh, publication. Uh, now, if G is planar, and that's the instance instead, and we're looking for covered by vertex disjoint copies of H uh, with connected planar graph H of order greater than or equal three, that's known to be uh, MP complete by Berman. So here's just a little bit of the background, some of the history. Uh, behind what's motivated some of the study of uh, looking at uh, these H matchable graphs. All right. Now we'll move on to the uh, <coughs> graph uh, theoretic uh, uh, portion of the, uh, I'm sorry, the zero forcing part portion of the talk. So just kind of a reminder of those, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, zero forcing. Um, this whole idea is that uh, we let uh, each vertex of a graph G, all right, be given one or two colors. Uh, let's say uh, uh, red and blue, and let's let Z denote the initial set of uh, red uh, vertices of G, 
Now, the color change rule converts the color of a vertex from blue to red if the blue vertex is the only blue neighbor of a red vertex. And the set Z is said to be a zero forcing set of G if all vertices of G will be turned, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, if all vertices of G will be turned red after finitely many applications of the color change rule. And the zero forcing number of G, uh, Z of G is a minimum of uh, all Z's over all zero forcing sets C that are a subset of the vertex set of G. Okay, now uh, <clears throat> the zero forcing number came about uh, of, uh, as a, uh, uh, of a simple graph was introduced by the uh, AIM minimum rank special graphs work group. And this was to be able to bound the minimum rank for numerous families of graphs. Uh, zero forcing parameters have been investigated further and have been applied to the minimum rank problem in uh, lots of recent literature. And if we let Z be this initial set of red, red vertices, all right, the color change rule changes the color of a vertex W from a uh, blue to red if the blue vertex is the only blue neighbor of a red vertex U. In this case, we may say that U forces W and we uh, write U right arrow W. Of course, there may be more than one red vertex capable of forcing W, but we associate only one forcing vertex of W at a time. Okay. And then uh, applying the color change rule to all vertices of Z, we obtain an updated set of red vertices, uh, Z sub one, uh, a superset of Z, uh, clearly not all, sorry, there should be not all vertices in Z need to be forcing vertices. And if a vertex U in Z forces W, then U becomes inactive. In other words, unable to force thereafter. When the vertex W replaces U as a potential forcing vertex in Z sub one, this Z sub one has at most the order of Z many potentially forcing vertices. Now applying the color change rule to Z one results in another updated set, Z sub two, which is a superset of Z sub one, of now red vertices. All right. uh, and a chronological list of forces all right, is a record of forcing actions in the order in which they are performed. Now, given any chronological list of forces, a forcing chain is a sequence, U sub one, U sub two through U sub T, such that U sub one forces, uh, U sub one, uh, uh, U sub, or sorry, U sub I forces, U sub I plus one, excuse me, for I uh, equals one, two through T sub uh, T minus one. All right. Oops. And so what we have actually found, all right. So then there's some uh, uh, canonical uh, results uh, that I, that from zero forcing that I left out. Like for instance, that uh, the zero forcing number of a path is just simply one. You just take one of the leaves and it can knock everything down all the rest of the way. Or for like a cycle, for instance, you take two that are uh, adjacent to each other, and uh, that's enough to force all the other uh, vertices around the edge of the cycle. Uh, so I did uh, leave out some of those, but I wanted to uh, make uh, for sure present uh, this result, which we found uh, uh, with this was uh, uh, I had most of the proof, and then my uh, one of my uh, former advisees, uh, Houston uh, Houston Sherger, who just recently learned. Uh, earned his uh, PhD from the uh, University of, uh, uh, of uh, North Texas uh, for uh, all matching graphs uh, G such that the, under the contraction map phi sub M of G is tree, we have that the zero forcing number of G has to be bounded in between the zero forcing uh, uh, number for H and N, where N is the number of copies of uh, H in the graph G, so N times the zero forcing number of H. All right, so here uh, N is the number of copies of H, as I said, in G, and phi sub M is that function that we that we use to contract each copy of H in an H matchable graph to a vertex. Thus, phi sub M of G is the graph resulting from replacing each copy of H in G by a single vertex. All right, therefore, if there are N vertex induced and independent copies of H and G, then phi sub M of G has N vertices. And whenever phi sub M of G is a tree, we will call these tree-like matchable graphs. Note that neither 
H nor G necessarily have to be trees themselves. All right. So let's look at an example uh, of an instance of G that realizes the lower bound. So here we have obviously like a big path, what we can think of being it being broke down into copies of uh, P sub three, right? And uh, the zero forcing uh, number, as I said earlier on pass, right, is just one, all right? Uh, now, even though that this path, since it's evenly divisible by three, uh, we can um, still just use that one vertex as long as we're taking one of the leaves. And that's enough, this red vertex uh, would be enough to force all these other vertex vertices in sequence, all right? And then turn every single vertex red, all right? So here's an instance of G that realizes the lower bound, not very interesting, but it is an ex uh, example not, nonetheless. Uh, and here's a little bit more complicated that re uh, example that realizes the upper bound, all right? Um, so in general, uh, if we want, we could consider a, actually more general than this uh, specific example, we could in general uh, consider a, a PS box a P, a P sub T with phi of M uh, being, uh, phi sub M, excuse me, of G being a path, right? So we can't actually eliminate any of these uh, red vertices in this instance and still be able to force everything in the graph red. All right, so we actually, it's absolutely uh, necessary that we actually take the number of uh, vertices from each copy, right, uh, of these to um, uh, be able to force all of our vertices red, okay? All right, and these last couple uh, slides are just a couple, couple extra bonus slides that I threw in. Now, this one right here actually is already, uh, is uh, some of the, someone else's, uh, previous results, and uh, this is on pineapple graphs. Uh, so here we consider a complete graph K sub N with P pendant vertices off of one vertex. And here we see that uh, the zero forcing number of uh, P and P as we'll call it, P, P sub uh, N comma P we'll call it, is equal to N uh, plus P uh, minus two. All right, so we actually have to take all of the vertices except for uh, the one that has the pendant vertices off of it and all but one vertex from the list of pendant vertices in order to be able to force this graph. Right? And this kind of borrows some of its ideas also from uh, the zero forcing number on a complete graph as well, right? You have to take all but one vertices, so otherwise you basically have always uh, at least what I would call like a co-defender, right? Something else helping that vertex from uh, turning uh, red, all right? All right, now this, however, is a new result. This is just kind of something after I had seen this result, I kind of uh, played around with. So instead of pineapple graphs, why not let's have uh, mutant pineapples, right? So people kind of think of a pineapple graph for that reason, right? Is you got that little grid area that looks like the, the fruit part of the pineapple and then the, the little leaves coming off the top. Well, what if we had leaves, uh, you know, those little, sets of tufts of leaves coming off all over the place, right? Uh, and I kind of just <clears throat> jokingly coined the term uh, mutant pineapple graphs, all right? So maybe some uh, pineapples that were exposed to a little bit of radiation or something. Um, and uh, if this is the case and we have a uh, uh, piece of one through piece of K different pendant vertices all the way around, right? Then instead our vo zero forcing number here becomes uh, P sub NP, which is equal to, uh, or a zero, zero forcing number of P sub NP becomes uh, N plus the sum of P sub one through P sub K, and then we subtract off the, uh, the uh, K, uh, K plus one, okay? So we do actually have to go uh, one over that. All right, um, very good. Um, all right, uh, let's see, I think I have, uh, oh yeah, have a nice little uh, area here for direction for future research. Um, we could invest other classes of graphs such that phi sub m is a member of that class of graphs such as cycles, complete graphs, and wheels. Um, I also thought about maybe perhaps applying phi sub m more than once to a graph, right? So maybe we have such a, a, a nice little neat structure that when we do the contraction, we can still find a new H matching on the resultant graph and maybe kind of go through an iterative process of taking uh, uh, 
uh, phi sub m. Now, of course, it's not necessarily going to be phi sub m since m refer re references a specific matching. So, of course, uh, it might be a, a phi sub m and then a phi sub m plot prime that we apply to it the, uh, the sec for the second iteration. All right. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> maybe something where we could kind of iterate this process over and over again. So, there's just kind of some initial ideas that I had for directions for future result with combining these ideas of these. Uh, H matchings uh, with um, the zero forcing numbers. Um, now here's some of those uh, references that I had uh, uh, promised earlier. There's uh, the AIM minimum uh, rank special work uh, work group. Uh, that was uh, one of the, um, the the big ones that's, that generated the whole idea of zero zero forcing sets uh, to begin with. Uh, and then here's some of the references as well uh, that I used for. Uh, for that table that was constructed earlier, the different uh, instances. Um, and um, if you want to know a little bit more about uh, the H matching graphs, it was actually something that I'd come up with with my advisor, uh, Lane, uh, Dr. Lane Clark. Uh, and there's a, we have a couple of publications out on uh, that, and that's basically our generalized matches in forests and trees. And uh, since then, we've also um, done a, a, a paper on... Uh, the distance distribution, and we have a paper on the degree distribution of these H matchable graphs uh, coming out shortly. Um, and I think the remainder of these references are mostly from the table or some of the ideas that I've gotten as far as uh, uh, where I got some of my ideas for uh, the, uh, the zero forcing numbers and how to combine them with uh, H matchable graphs before. So, whoops. All right, and that's uh, all I got for you today. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, if we could all thank our speaker in some way, and then we'll, we'll open it up for some questions. Oh, looks like I got somebody here in chat. Oh, just just some thank yous, I think. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I'm so I'm so used to doing that automatically now from classes this semester. Yeah. It's like because some students will only ask them, you know, in the chat box, and some will only ask them verbally. So you gotta, yeah, exactly. you always gotta be on top of. That. Yeah. Okay. Do we have any questions for our speaker? Yeah, I have one. So Andrew, you listed a number of MP complete problems where there was a component of size three. So what if you want to match with an edge and an isolated vertex? Is it also MP complete or unknown? So let me understand. So you want to match both a, uh, an edge and an a isolated vertex? My three vertex graph is an edge and an isolated vertex. And I think you want oh. to make induced copies of this to cover all vertices. Uh, let me uh, get. Let me think. So, uh, so you're talk, referencing back to the table, like you have a isolated vertex and a, and, a, and two vertices with an edge, right? So you're yes. looking at uh, an H that's uh, disconnected itself. Yes, yeah, since um, then you don't have a component of order three. Right. Right. Um, yeah, that's a good. Uh, that's a good question. Now, let's see. I mean, that, I guess that would be closest. Uh, so, I guess that would be closest to. Yeah, that's a tough question. That because that would be really close to the instance being a, a tree. Well, you wouldn't know because the tree itself, the tree, it's, it wouldn't have a tree itself. So you'd be looking more like a forest G, right? A subgraph uh, isomorphic to a tree H, but you're really your subgraph is really isomorphic to a forest rather than a tree, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, honest, I honestly do not know off the top of my head. My initial intuition, though, would be that it would be, uh, it would be polynomial. I, I, my, my initial intuition that that would be, it, it, I would cheat more towards the polynomial uh, side than the, because um, um, if I remember, it, Correctly from it's and it's been a while since I've constructed this uh, table that first motivated some of this research, but I, I believe that um, the 
the stronger the connectivity of the graph, the more difficult it was to find uh, matchings in general in a lot of the other literature. So the, the, the disconnectivity there, I think actually aids in finding and helping you be able to find uh, uh, your matchings. And, and especially if you have your isolated vertices, it seems like you could just kind of keep your isolated vertices almost off to the side, if you will, just find those copies of the edge inside, right? And then and just grab one of those isolated vert vertices. Well, but those isolated vertices might be obviously isolated in the sense of the uh, of of inside of the copy, or uh, whenever you look at the vertex induced copy of that H. But obviously, they're not not necessarily isolated whenever you are looking at the overall graph G before the contractive maps map applies. So, huh. I, that's that's actually that's a good question. I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to think about that one a little bit more. I, I, oh, thank you. No problem. Yeah. That's, isn't it, it's equivalent to packing, matching with uh, P3s, yeah? the complement. Because yeah, because you would have. Yeah, so you because you're looking at the so you'd be looking at the the complement. Yeah. Hmm. Is that I'm I'm like searching right now. I see some approximation algorithms for the maximum P3 packing. So maybe it's hardened for the exact. So you're thinking it's you thinking it's MP hard? Just from the initial, mm -hmm. but just from the initial search, of course. I mean, I don't know, <laughs> but um, yeah. Yeah, because I mean, yeah, if because I at first I was I think I was thinking of it when I first said polynomial, I was thinking. I think I was thinking like, okay, well, you know, I wasn't thinking back to the originating graph G before you apply that contractive map, because yeah, when you're back in that map, I mean, you have all these other edges that could potentially be in there, right? That could, that, that you don't just get a, as I said earlier, like try to simply just set them to the isolated vertices to the side and then grab them as you need them. But uh, yeah, because of the fact that you're looking at it in terms of the complement being P3 map, then you would be, well, as far as the complement is concerned, then you're back to just a tree, right? Which is which is which is known with that specific question in that specific instance. But uh, let me, see. yeah, no, that's a that's a that's a that's a that's a good question. I really, yeah. I guess I'm that the algorithm you just described still is exhaustive, though, right? I mean, you can just take all of your possible, however many isolated vertices you need, check if there's a perfect matching on the rest, and then check and see if there's edges across once you add them back in anyway. And that's still all polynomial. Yeah, that's As true. exhausted all of them. Yeah. No, that is. Yeah, because if we use, whoops. So, because you have an H match, which, H matchable tree, yeah, because you're oh, sorry, not sorry, not this algorithm. The, the algorithm that you had just decided, putting the isolated vertices away, and then checking right, for right. perfect matchings in the rest, and then just check if there's edges across, and then just do that for all possible sets of vertices that you need to throw away. That would all be polynomial, I think. Yeah, because because yeah, because you would have the advantage of that you were looking for just a pat a piece of two and an isolated vertex in your tree. So you would look at it as far as looking at it for underneath the map. Yes, you're right. It, after the map has already applied and you had like say a perfect matching in hand. Yeah, and then you're just checking for additional edges. Yeah, I think I think I think you're I think you're right there. I think you're I think you're good. Yeah, no, I haven't, honestly, I haven't really explored a whole bunch of the, I, I'm, glad, I'm really glad that you actually asked that question, because I really honestly haven't explored a lot of the, uh, like, the disconnected ca cases of H yet. Like, I, my natural intuition on a lot of this stuff was just to look at, like, you know, connected graphs, but I think those those disconnected graphs pose some interesting questions. Uh, yeah, those are definitely worth look at, looking into, for sure. Well, see, it looks like Kirkpatrick and Hell showed that partitioning the vertex set of an arbitrary graph into uh, induced P3s, induced, I'm not sure, 
Um, is MP hard? But of course, it's not, not for trees, it's for general graph. Yeah, I think that, uh, that Kurt Patrick and Hell, that might be the same reference that I have here on the first, on that first instance in the table, actually. That might be the same uh, publication where they did that. The 83? Um, yeah. yeah. Let me see. Let's go back to the. Uh, where is that? Hell. Oh. At home, where is the at home paper? Well, there's the hall paper. Huh. Did I maybe, uh, maybe I tried to squeeze too much on a slide and it might have, <laughs> my reference might have, well, one, one either, of, it looks like it went above. Yeah, because Chilla Macari was the last one. It looks like it went above. I tried, it looks like I tried to squeeze too many. <laughs> references on a slide but yeah but i believe I, I, uh that's the same paper that i was uh referring to in the, in the reference but yeah that that was uh that would go along with of course the first uh entry we have here in this table it you know mp uh or uh, you know seem to agree with that at least anyway so but yeah that's uh No, it's always it's it's always interesting. I think where where uh, uh, these things break, if you will, right? Where where they switch from polynomial to NP hard. It's just there's that there's that threshold where it just kind of uh, you know where it occurs, which is always I don't know. I always find fascinating. Do we have any other questions for our speaker? Okay, if not, thanks again, Andrew, for the talk. And thanks everybody for making it out and have a good Thanksgiving break. We won't have a seminar next week, obviously. And then the, the last one of the semester will be the week after that. So thanks everybody for making it out and happy Thanksgiving.